Radio Free Sparrow. Welcome to Radio Free Scarrow, episode number 718. I am Stephen in Edmonton. Warren of Vancouver. And Chris in Edmonton. This is it, folks. This is, uh, remember, so back uh, at Comic-Con, we planned for an episode, uh, potentially, of a Doctor Who thing going on at Comic-Con. Never happened. We So we said, okay, well, maybe something will happen at New York Comic-Con. We'll sort of, like, leave a space out there for some news happening there. Never happened. Well, guess what? All the news that we were expecting, trailers, news, broadcast dates, it all happened this week. It's all here. All of it. Mm-hmm. All of it. All of the all Doctor of Who news it's... in one year has happened in one week, and we get to talk about it today it's, it's on this the, podcast. It's the wedding of River song of news. Everything is happening at once. It is. It really is. 5.02 p.m. Four hour or perhaps year broadcast on it. Yeah. Uh, so so much so that we've we've we had a whole list of merchandise to talk about. Uh, we are bumping that to the next week. Doctor Who Radio Free Scarrow's Christmas Guide 2019 coming next week because there's so much news <laughs> to talk about. I think most of the tat we'll be talking about comes out next year anyway. <laughs> exactly. So we, we could we could bump that. We're having to prioritize. Uh, also on this uh, on this podcast, an interview with former Doctor Who brand manager Edward Russell, who of course was, was responsible for quite a few um, series launches over the years when he was with Doctor Who. So we'll be talking to him about uh, about that. And just how difficult and, and and different approaches, perhaps to to uh, releasing and, and promoting new series of uh, of Doctor Who. Some interesting stuff in there. So stay tuned for that. Probably in an hour and a half, once we get through all the news <laughs> that has happened this past week. So the big news, of course, being officially now, we can say uh, New New Zealand TV sales sheets be damned. Doctor Who returns January 1st with Spyfall, the first of a two-part story. Uh, it airs on New Year's Day, and the uh, following episodes air on Sunday, starting January 5th. Day and date, BBC, BBC America, uh, I almost said space, <laughs> CTV Sci-Fi. In, in our hearts, it will always be space. Yeah. So in it, our it, hearts, that brand will be a yeah. brand. I mean, I mean, CTV Sci-Fi just rolls off the tongue so much better than space. <laughs> it rolls so off nice. the tongue and right into the garbage. It's so By the nice. way, whenever I hear... Whenever I hear Spyfall, I just want to belt it out like Adele. Spyfall. I know. Well, I'm hoping that perhaps Jodie Whittaker will do that because, I mean, she can sing. We, we've all heard a version of Yellow, um, about which more later. Uh, yes, uh, um, Spyfall, uh, episode one, BBC America is airing at 8 p.m. Eastern time. I believe probably Sci CT. God, call it space. Everyone, we're calling yeah, it space. space. It's space. That's space. all there is to it. I cannot say that stupid. There's five syllables. There's eight letters. There's five syllables. That is uneconomical. Um, we are not hewing to the CTV brand. We don't care. We're not paid by them. We, we never will be. Aren't tough. Um, uh, it's probably airing at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern as well. It's 6:55 p.m. on New Year's Day on BBC One. There's no indication of how long it'll be. Like uh, last year, the, the episodes are sort of like 50-ish or more minutes. Um, there's no indication of, as to how long these episodes are. Um, well, the BBC released the whole New Year's Day schedule, so I mean, you can go based on that. Did they really? Well, yeah. well yeah, how long I, is it then? I don't have the whole thing to hand because we only oh. really care about Doctor Who. From, like, I don't care about the um, Mrs. Brown's boys and Miranda. And like, it's Doctor Who. What? Miranda is the lead in for Doctor <laughs> what you, Who. What are you talking about? <laughs> really, Miranda is really Miranda's so, like, the lead in for Doctor Who. I remember that Mrs. Brown's but, boys single handedly destroys my faith in the British Empire oh, more that, so than Brexit. He really does, yeah. Because <laughs> often it follows Doctor Who and like it like sort of like hey, it's Doctor Who on oh Mrs. Brown. What oh yeah, oh, I think Mrs. What? Brown's boys is later in the night, but yeah, Doctor Enjoy Who Intelligent is, Sci-Fi followed by dumb yeah. crap. I don't know, Doctor Who Doctor Who has like an hour and five like sixty five minute time slot or something like that. I can't remember. Wow, that's exciting. It is the biggest episode they've ever done. So, so this says the uh, the marketing speak. Um, 
so that's that's very exciting. We had a tra- we had two trailers basically. We had the original trailer and then a launch trailer. I guess is what uh, the series launch. I don't know what they call it. They call it something else. Series release date uh, trailer, which was slightly yeah. different. Was that the sci- sci-fi in the states one or or BBC America? I mean. No, nope. uh, no, no. It was, no, it, was uh, it was a BBC One one. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. That was confused. that was that was the one that the shows the the trailer for for the launch date shows mo- seems to show because uh, we're not sure yet. Obviously, seems to show mostly uh, stuff from episode well the, from the opening story uh, with a little bit from later on, but mm-hmm. uh, um, the uh, other one uh, not so much a trailer. It's a clip of the. Clip of episode one. Oh, right. Yes, yes. Okay, I watched um, that. Sorry. Yeah, but a little yeah. over a minute long with Stephen Fry featuring prominently. That's that's the one that they showed on the uh, Graham Norton show uh, as yeah. well. Uh, Jody Whitaker was on this past week. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about that right now since we're on it. Uh, yeah, Jody Whitaker was on Graham Norton with uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, uh, mm-hmm. Kevin Hart, Michael Palin. Harry um, Styles. Harry Styles. Good song, by the way. I like that song. Oh, I, <laughs> I watched the. It. Oh really? Oh, it's a good song. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I look, I look at Harry Styles there. Uh, I'm not that familiar with his music, but I've, I've literally heard two of his songs, and I, I like them. Uh, and what I looked at, and, and I'm sure everyone, everyone listening to this will get the reference. But I see Harry Styles in the big long uh, uh, pair of pants that he had on, and the sort of like uh, stylish collared shirt. And I think, you know what? That is a 1978 Robert Palmer right there. I'm comparing <laughs> oh, him. God. I'd say it's Tom Baker in The Deadly Assassin. But, uh, no, um, no. Well, you never saw it. So the I, thing about One Direction is that I'm cutting together a fan vid featuring music for One Direction at the behest of Kim Rogers and Sage Young. Right. And at first I was like, oh, am I going to hate this? And I was like, oh, this actually isn't bad. I mean, I yeah. wouldn't go out of my way to see it. I'm not a huge fan like they are, and they mm-hmm. are huge fans of One Direction yeah. and uh, <laughs> all the individual members, but I didn't hate it. So there you go. There's a 49, soon to be 49 year old man's take on One Direction. I'm sure you're all clamoring for. I had, yeah. I'd, I'd heard the name Harry Styles, so I had no idea he was part of One Direction until like he was two days ago. Yeah, well, there's was, a whole ask Say Jung and Kim Rogers because they know no, all the lore. No. I, I don't think he was part of the uh, Doctor Who um, uh, live uh, <laughs> fiasco. I don't think he was one of the two cats that were on there. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but uh, uh, most of that show, which I, I kind of felt bad for Dodie Whitaker having to basically explain what Doctor Who was to mm. Dwayne the Rock Johnson and well, Kevin Hart. Not 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 only did she have to explain what Doctor Who was, she had to speak slowly. Yeah. So that they could understand her in the first place. Under, understand. At least well, what I love is that Dwayne the Rock Johnson keeps getting cast by idiots as the Rock. I mean, not as the Rock, as the doc, as Doctor Who. People are like, "Well, Dwayne the Rock Johnson should be Doctor Who," you know. And then they're soundly yelled at on Twitter. But, yeah. but it is something that comes up time and time again. So the fact that he doesn't know what the hell it is kind of makes me happy. Yeah. Well, he, he I think he do. He was basically playing straight man to Kevin Hart a little bit, and then and then Mike Michael Palin came on much later. I barely got any time. I wonder if he got edited out. There, <laughs> but that's a I mean, but Michael it, Michael Palin at least got in a, a nice little uh, Yorkshire thing that's for, true. for him and Jody. Yeah, bookending the two Americans in the color. Uh, is Dwayne Johnson America or is he from like Samoa? No, he's American. He's born. He's, he's born in the he's states. He's from Hawaii, I think. He's born in the I, states. This is where I I know nothing of Dwayne Johnson's no, lore either. He was wasn't born in. Hawaii. He wasn't the CFL. That I do know. He wasn't the CFL. That's right. His, he was. And his father is from Amherst, Nova Scotia, where I used to live. Canadian connection to Dwayne he's, the Rock Johnson. He's got a he's got Canadian citizenship. Does he? Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. Wow. So he could become prime minister and then president. Uh, he could do at uh, both at the same time. As long as he tells, <laughs> as long as would that solve or cause problems? <laughs> as long as he reveal, maybe, oh, maybe, maybe he's the one to bring the universe together. Who knows? He, he will bring um, balance to the force. Yeah, I, uh, you are so, Anakin Skywalker. So they they <laughs> just sh- went somewhere. They showed uh, they showed the clip on of, um, but you know that if it's a, if it's a preview clip, you know that it is it is probably so inconsequential and probably happens within the first like mm-hmm. twelve seconds of oh, the episode. Oh, guaranteed. Yeah. Uh, but that's what it was. It was, you know, just a scene setter. We won't, well, it's in the links in the show notes if you want to go watch it. But, uh, but it's interesting, you know, cause they, they shoot the Graham Norton show like on the, um, Thursday night, the night prior that to airing and then they edit it. Like it's, it's not a live show per se and it's only a weekly show. And so they, there was a whole section of where they talk about Jody's singing of, of yellow for the children in need al- album. And they pre- presented her with a silver record for sales and stuff of that album, like surprised her on, on set. That part did not make the actual final cut of the episode, but the, the BBC did post it on, on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, Can I just say about that clip that I could listen to Stephen Fry read the phone book. Like <laughs> that oh, guy's got yeah. 
the beautiful voice. Well, I mean, yeah. he's well, whether it's Hitchhiker's stuff or yeah. like he, yeah, the only choice for the book other than the original. He he narrated uh, the audiobooks for for the Harry Potter stuff. And, like he, he, he's really he's done a lot of uh, audiobook work. Yeah, good stuff. And he's a Doctor Who, so that's exciting. And Finally, a li- and a lifelong Doctor Who fan. Yeah. Uh, so uh, where are we here? We're just sort of rattling. We stuff. are all over the place. That's where oh, we, we are. are. As, as we are. Like, all the links are in the show notes, folks, on, on your listening devices and stuff like that. By the way, can I just interject here that the Fluid Links uh, the, uh, advent calendar continues apace during this month? Um, if it, it would behoo- I, would, I would deem it a personal favor if you would go and watch the YouTube versions. Yes, they are which, excellent. He puts a lot of work into them. Yep. For which I am working my ass off and falling dreadfully behind trying to complete. Uh, so... Um, please go and do that um, because we're never doing them again because uh, they take so much work. They, <laughs> you, say, you, say that, you say that now until you get an idea for next year and you're like, exactly. oh, I want a completely different set for the for the Lego Telesnap Advent stuff. Each and, one of them will be in a different Doctor Who set from no, the 70s. I, I, can't, I don't think I can top the 1980s TARDIS set. That's, that's the dream set <laughs> that's right true. there. So that's, I don't know. This, Secondary so in, control room. No, enjoy. I'm not appeasing Warren. I'm just saying, if you want to make it look like tube cam, I know yeah. how to do that in After Effects, so let's do that. <laughs> let's plan uh, next yeah, year's sure. right now on air. Uh, Yeah. Maybe a Patreon goal. Maybe that. Um, <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, uh, Fluid Links, Evan Calendar happening all, all week up, all month rather, up until the 24th. Um, the Say, this is exciting. So basically, it's, you know, last season of Doctor Who, which I think we were relatively okay with. I don't think we were as enthusiastic as perhaps prior seasons, but we weren't offended by it or anything like that. It, it was very much treated by by Chris Chibnall and the gang, I think, as a recruitment year, I believe is the catchphrase that's sort of been going yep. around. Um, where it's th- like, sort of like just laying everything bare and like being a little bit minimalist perhaps in approach. No cold opens, no two-parters. No, no theme tune cla- for some no of them. Theme tune, no classic monsters or anything like that. Well, some of these episodes this time around will be like the, the opening uh, uh, two episodes will be a two-part episode. Some of them, not all of them, will feature a cold open. So the old uh, the old ways are sort of creeping back into the way they're they're doing Doctor Who. I'm I'm kind of intrigued by the fact that some of them have cold opens, and some of them don't. Which I'm ah uh, good. Well, Kremlin eyes the hell out of this. Well, I, no, I like it because sometimes you know you look at a cold open and think, well, that probably shouldn't have been a cold open, or perhaps like why why are why are we going on for eight minutes for this just to get to a a good spot for mm. an end of a cold open. Um, so I, I I like that they are not like being forced upon them, but if the, if a cold open is there, they're going for it. I kind of well, like that approach. As we've talked about in the past, the the cold open for a lot of stories previously, that would basically be episode one from a classic series story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I, I in in the link in the show notes, I like the way Chibnall phrases it. He says, "Some have a cold open, some don't." I think the danger is if you shape everything toward it all the time then your shapes will become predictable. And he's mm-hmm. not wrong. I mean, the more you do something, the easier it is to guess what's going to happen. So mixing it up, not a bad idea. Yeah, not a bad idea at all. Um, also, uh, I, I should say this, that uh, um, the Total TV Guide cr- uh, Christmas double issue is coming uh, out this week. I think it's been spotted in some shops this weekend as well. Uh, but in an uh, article with short interview with Jodie Whittaker, as done by Graham Kibble White, uh, she actually, s- two things of, in- of interest here that she talks about is that uh, she confirms that she's back for a third series. I know that there was like a slight question as to whether uh, that was going to happen, maybe, uh, but but it, she's back for a third series and presumably so is Chris Chibnall and maybe others, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the rest of the cast have not indicated one way or the other if they're Are back Are you saying that rumors turned out to just be rumors? I can't well, believe it. Well, quite possibly. And, and, and the, the, other, the other thing is that uh, she, she kind of, like, the, the title of the, uh, of the piece is I get very stroppy about this because she's Jodie Whittaker sort of, like, fought back a little bit about, like, hey, why was there no Doctor Who in 2019? And uh, just by sort of saying, you know, well, hey, we, we made the thing up until like July. Then the press was, you know, the press tour was like for about two or three months and then we're back at it. So yeah, and of from, course there's no And from her here. point of view and everybody else on the crew's point of view, it's like we put all this work in and now you're yelling at us. Yeah. <laughs> so I, can, I, can, I get where she's coming from. 
Yeah, it. I mean, I'm still intrigued by the fact that that uh, you know there was probably supposed to be at San Diego Comic Con, but uh, but we're not, and um, I'm not sure if they were ever supposed to be at New York Comic Con, but um, but maybe that'll come out in due course. Anyway, um, uh, the that uh, that's in shops now, or will be officially out in shops on on Tuesday. The Total TV Guide's Christmas double issue. Um, all all the all the publications are there. Actually, the Radio Times. Uh, article i think because i bought it with uh with jody and crew on the cover um posing in christmas themed stuff even though they're not on at christmas uh is I that actually, a digital copy or it di- yeah i bought the digital copy oh, i didn't yeah. know they did digital for for people they over did? This, over here yeah yeah if that's how i bought all of them i buy the whole magazine for those four pages of doctor who content mm. and then <laughs> <laughs> that's really on brand of, of for you Stephen. it I, is i remember back in the Back in the day when I first moved, well, not when I first, shortly after I moved to, to Britain, um, uh, there's a Radio Times cover with uh, Tennant and Davison for Time Crash, and I bought and mailed you guys copies. Yes, oh, I still have it somewhere. I think I do too, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's all, boy, there's, I mean, even today as we as as we talk about stuff, I mean, th- apparently the Jadoon have invaded Victoria Station. Apparently, um, yeah. I saw two different... <laughs> Um, okay. Beth, Beth from the time ladies, I know shot some stuff and put it on Twitter. So did or Facebook or whatever. Um, yeah. and another, another person I know shot some footage from Victoria station this morning. Yeah. That's awesome. That, that reminds me of the, like the sixties and seventies where they would basically <laughs> in, in a way test out the costume designs by, Hey, we got new Cybermen. Let's send them out into the public. And so that's what they did. Like there's a whole bunch of shots of tomb of the Cybermen, Cybermen waiting around for buses and stuff and <laughs> taunting dogs and everything else. And Cyber- that's how we defeat them. Cyberman yeah. life- bus service. Cybermen mm-hmm. lifestyle shots. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all sorts of stuff happening. Uh, what else we got here? Spawn for six, five, five, five PM cold open two parters. Uh, Dude, obviously what, what do you got there, Chris? Fathom. Fathom. Fathom the events. Screening. There's a screening. So there's a screening. Uh, the tickets went on sale December 6th. The, um, when's the screening for? It's on the 5th, right? The Sunday mm-hmm. the 5th? The Sunday the 5th is showing uh, part 1 and part 2 of the parts opener. 1 and 1, 2. So basically, I'm imagining that part 2 will go out at the time or shortly after it started airing on, on BBC America proper. Yeah. Uh, so that you'll basically watch a broadcast version of... of um, of part two in the cinema. Well, if, you won't actually see it early. Yeah. If, if, so let's say seven o'clock happens to be the time just to mm-hmm. pull a number out of thin air and that makes it 12 o'clock our time or two o'clock Eastern. So they do the screening then or after. Uh, but it seems to be, seems to be so far anyway, us only, uh, there's nothing been, nothing has yet been put on like Cineplex's website for, for Canada's participation. Yeah. Well, but, yeah, that's uh, usual. the, uh, yeah. The, the cast are doing a, they'll be in New York for their part. Apparently. I know. Uh, yeah, but the, they'll be, the they'll cat- be doing a Q and a after, after the, like a live simulcast Q and a after the, this, the episode two screening. This is quite something. They're actually flying to New York just to do a Q and a. I imagine there's, there might be, maybe there's a live, live actual panel in New York. I don't know. Just to be very odd that we're just going to fly you to a panel in a room basically in New York. <laughs> maybe maybe they're do doing that something in the else UK. for Maybe they're doing something else for like BBC America in New York and that just happens to coincide. That's probably it, actually. There's probably going to be an even bigger press launch for BBC America. And maybe we'll get thrown a, a bone or something in Canada. Hey, listen, we talked to Edward Russell about that in the interview, by the way, about uh, about Canada sort of getting the short straw a little bit. So stay tuned. Oh, interesting. That. Finally. Justice. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, so that's exciting for people who can go to screen. Yeah, we didn't have... We had a screening for... Um, the first episode, uh, Woman Who Fell to Earth last year, but we didn't have one for what was it, Legopolis, right? Right. Like, Bar- yeah. like that. So basically, we've this means we're down two of the um cinema screenings regarding Doctor Who in a row in Canada. Sigh. Hmm. Oh well, always a bridesmaid and so forth. Hmm. <laughs> Uh, other interesting news, a lot of people picked up on this already, that uh, Goran uh, Visnich in, in the trailer looked, apparently had a very similar hairstyle to one Nikola Tesla. Uh, well, that's because he's playing Nikola Tesla, and and uh, Robert Glendister is playing Thomas Edison. Ooh, it, cage fight. Yeah, it's a cage fight at Doctor Who, so that's uh, that's very intri- intriguing. Faraday so cage that, fight. 
Oh, there <laughs> how would you ever know then? <laughs> you <laughs> could never tell. Don't, don't, don't take away our, don't give away our episode titles before we know. Uh, good point. That's <laughs> okay. That, Bookmark that one. We just came up with that right now, but that is a great episode title. Bookmark that one. Bookmark that title. Uh, yeah. So that's that's happening. It's very intriguing that they actually uh, announced that. Uh, that was Chris Chibnall himself in the Radio Times uh, announcing that. So oh, he's getting a little loose lip there for a Chris Chibnall. Bit. Yeah. Um, did anybody see the trailer? By the way, we didn't. We we sort of zapruded the hell out of the first trailer. We didn't talk much about the second trailer. Did we? Um, anybody watch that uh, as closely? I didn't. I didn't Not download closely, it no. and like zapruder no. it. And uh, well, like, like yeah. I said, like I said earlier, it appears that most of it is from the opening story, with the little bits toward the end for for later stuff. Possibly, yeah. But that's, who can that's tell? As, from that's as far as I really took it. Because mm. you know everything's in the can. They can probably put anything in the trailer mm-hmm. that they want that isn't doesn't require like uh uh special effects or stuff like that so mm. anyway it's a good trailer um yeah a little more a little more doom and gloom perhaps you know the doctor a little bit foreboding uh towards what the what the doctor's doing a little bit of lenny henry there other stuff exciting stuff two trailers things. yeah things Such also like. happening mm-hmm. um so yes, uh, I just I'm going down the news list as well just to see what we have covered and what we haven't. Uh, hey, Russia! Russia has has bought Doctor Who series twelve. It'll air the and same we'll hack day it soon as, afterwards. Yes, it'll air the same day uh, in the UK and uh, and uh, the previous uh, eleven series will be will be on VOD. So once I, we've said this before, but when people say, "Hey, will Doctor Who ever just sort of be canceled and stuff?" Um, the uh, the thing that will keep it alive forever and ever will be international broadcast deals, yep. signing multi-year deals that will overlap one another until the end of time. Um, not like, the end of time, but the actual <laughs> like that, end of time. Like that five-year Chinese deal we've, we've talked about in the past. Exactly. Like I, I, I cast, I'm casting my mind back to the uh, Graham Norton show and Jody Whittaker trying to kind of explain the phenomenon that, that is Doctor Who to, to a couple Americans sitting on the couch who have no, no sweet clue. And mm. she talks about it being like all over the world and whatever. And it's That's kind it's, of surprising at this point that they don't have a clue. Like it's given just how many Matt Smith billboards were in LA. Well, like at the time. Yeah, maybe they're busy people or they're just, you know, blinders or I suppose they like how, what they like and yeah. then sci-fi isn't part of it or I don't know. How many billboards? I'd be from Karen Gillan might've said, Hey, I was on Dr. Who. Well, that's that, that would be the, yeah, I, I, that that would, that would be, be the big thing. thing. Is is you know that said, they probably know her from the Marvel uh, Marvel movies more than anything. Yeah, uh, true. Yeah, outside of Jumanji, obviously. Isn't it crazy how Karen Gillan has gone on this massive Hollywood career? Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, she was in um briefly in uh the Big Short as well. I, mean, I was like, what was she doing in this? But was she know. really in that? And there was that? apparently B- barely. She's she's barely in it, but she is in it. Oh. And apparently, there's some some meeting with. She had with Moffat not too long ago, so everyone's surmising that they're getting back together for some project and in, in super secret or something. Which she would be the star for, but at this point, I would think. I would hope yeah. so. The main event. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, good. It's good to see Doctor Who people get get huge, like post post Doctor Who. Yeah, exactly. I know. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, of course she's in Jumanji. That's why you mentioned. Is that the, is that like the biggest anybody's gotten as a companion out of Doctor Who? I think it might be. Ooh. Well, I mean, like mm. profile wise, perhaps. I mean, I mean, t- you know, uh, not to diminish her accomplishments, but it's not like you know Karen Gillan in like she is usually part of an ensemble piece. But she no, is quite. Right. But I mean, just thinking of all the other companions, I think she's become the most successful. A pro- uh, anyway. I mean, well, I guess Arthur Darvill's up there too, I suppose. Well, I, Jenna I, Coleman I, is is the lead. Yeah, in Victoria. Fair, fair, and, yeah. Uh, but but Victor- and- Victoria Victoria is. Big in Britain and, and niche elsewhere. Like that's, you know, PBS yeah. Masterpiece Theater kind of kind of fair. Jumanji, Nebula, like those are those are massive. Yeah, I'm not saying quality. I'm just saying in terms of bigness. Of no, I know. Like they're Hollywood they're they're massive. Noise. They're massive. Yeah. I would I would I would venture to say she's probably done the best. Where and Matt Smith's gonna be a star for us, who knows? Also, what's his name from the young ones is in Last Jedi, so I think this contest is over. <laughs> Adrian, Adrian, <laughs> Adrian Edmondson. Edmondson. Yeah. 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 First he gets the first first line in the movie too. Uh, in the Last Jedi, I mean, yeah. No, oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm watching that uh, sometime next week. I think. Yeah, or this, I'm doing the next same. Weekend. We do Force Awakens and Last Jedi. Yeah, me too. As a as a refresher for the up to the uh, the new Star Wars. Film. If you didn't hear, they are making a new one. Um, 
I wasn't aware. Uh, yeah, it's happening apparently. Uh, the, also, uh, it's back to Doctor Who, uh, the remit of this podcast. Uh, uh, there's BBC America is doing their usual, not to diminish it, but they're doing a, another Doctor Who marathon around the the Christmas holiday season. Uh, it starts on on uh, December 24th with a whole bunch of uh, you know previous series like the new series of Doctor Who. But hey, they will also air the Macra Terror. Yeah. On what we would call Boxing Day, December twenty sixth in the in do the they call US. it Boxing Day? Do they no. call it anything? Like, nope. they do it not. is a day off for them, isn't it? No, nope. it is not. It nope. is not. Why just that. us? I mean, it's, I'm not complaining. Because we rule. It's, it's, not, we it, rule. It's, it's actually not a holiday in Canada either. No, oh. it's a no, thing in Canada. It anyway. it's, it's oh not, no, yeah. box, it's not a public bo- holiday. Boxing Day is a, ho- is a holiday in Canada. No, it's not. Not in Alberta. Oh well, well I always got it. off. <laughs> who cares about Alberta? Well, that's that's many times I'll say that. Actually, that's your employer's choice. It's not. It's not law. But oh. uh, but have you watched the? Well, we get it off as a day off. So have you watched Backer Terry yet, Stephen? Uh, I watched the first episode of it um, okay. because everything arrives at once. The uh, season twenty three Trial of the Time Lord box that arrives, so that I have to admit that kind of uh, bumped Backer Terry down a notch I in have the list. Seen it um, because I love that season twenty three box set to death. I watched all the um, <laughs> raw. <laughs> Location and studio footage. I watched an episode of uh, uh, the first installment of Behind the Sofa. I watched the first episode of the standalone version of Terror of the Zygons, which is pretty cool. Uh, uh, yeah, I love that to bits. And I watched the, the first a- episode of uh, Macro Terror as well. So, okay. yeah. I have seen the whole thing. Uh, oh, really? I saw Did it you? With really? one Mr. Graham Burke oh, a little while ago um, of Reality Bomb fame. Uh, and we both agreed that it is a very strange story, which is even stranger <laughs> in visual form, but yeah. does lend itself to animation in that way. Mm-hmm. I've I've read the novelization. I've I've seen a a recon, but I've yeah I've yet to yet to crack the plastic. I'm still going through the. Tenets. I saw it in color, so did I really see it? I yes, you really. Yes. When I, I when I when I watch Power of the Daleks, I only watch the color one. So interesting. Really, mm-hmm. I'm the opposite. I watched it in black and white. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's I'm cool basi- they made it in color. I don't have a problem with that, but I did watch it in black and white. Mm-hmm. They actually did make uh, Evil of the Daleks in color. That's the they had to remake it again when uh, BBC America said, hey, let's make it in color. <laughs> uh, but they did that from the start off uh, for Mac of Terror. Um, uh, mostly, when I look at uh, the Mac of Terror, I think that, hey, the reason we probably didn't get it for months in North America is because BBC America wanted to hold it back for broadcast, uh, which was finally yeah. on December 26th. So. Yeah. Thanks, BBC America. We love getting stuff months late because we're subject to your well, broadcast whims. Once, once upon a time, like I think back to the you know, two thousand um, mid two thousands with the series, series one box set. We we still got that way in advance of, of the states because Sci Fi it was going to come on the states and then Sci Fi said, hey, let's broadcast it. So they delayed the American DVD release, but we still got it. Yeah, um, I'd I'd like to go back to that kind of thing where. You know, if America <laughs> wants to do whatever, that's their choice. They're come they're, on, happenstance. They're, they're their own. Favorite. They're their own people. Uh, but uh, it doesn't don't 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 punish Canada. No, exactly. <laughs> that should be our motto. That should be on our crest of arms. Don't punish Canada. <laughs> yeah. Don't punish Canada, buddy. No punisho. That's my Latin right there. No punisho, yeah. Canada. <laughs> that is not as good as your French. Um, True, which is also bad. Is that uh, is that it? Is that all we got for uh, for all the? Um, Doctor Who news. I'm just scrolled through here. What did we miss? Uh, yeah, first look no, we, trailer. We got it all. Everything else. All right. Well, how about that? Um, then just a few things uh, to go for. Like I said, we're still bu- we're still bumping the uh, the the holiday gift guide to next week because there's a lot of it. <laughs> I want to give I want to give the tat uh, its proper due. Um, but there are some other other events. Of course, Gallifrey One. Hey, Gallifrey One is in two months' time. Everyone, what in oh. the hell is going on? Right. I yeah. say this every year, but whatever. Yeah. It, it just uh, it just always bowls me over. Have it, you booked your flight, Warren? Nope, not yet. <laughs> yeah, because you're. Uh, but listen, I uh, thanks to a Cyber Monday sale uh, here in Canada. In quotes, I, I yeah. Well, it was like fifteen percent off a ludicrously overpriced flight, so we finally booked our flights to um, to Gallifrey One. Oh, good. Yep the 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 fact that I have to put up with the flash crew outside my door every day uh, <laughs> is paid off for by once a year by the fact that my flights to L.A. are a little cheaper thanks to yeah. all those. Hollywood drones going back and forth. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, the the pri- oh man, the prices from Edmonton to L.A. direct flight is just uh, I I could I could fly to London for cheaper uh, mm-hmm. than I could fly to Los Angeles. It is ridiculous. Um, 
Gallifrey won. Hey, they announced Michelle Ryan. Michelle Ryan, Lady Christina from Planet of the Dead. And of course, the corresponding big bionic finish. Woman. Uh, the bionic uh, woman herself. And yep. the bionic woman, not Lindsay uh, Wagner, of course. And she was, she was also in Jekyll. Was oh, she yeah. really in Jekyll? Well, mm-hmm. she's coming to Gallifrey one Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so that was announced as well, um, in addition to the Pearl Mackey news from, from last week. The Galley 2020 ticket sales have reopened. They used to be called transfers. They're now called ticket resales. So if you bought a ticket when uh, uh, earlier and now have decided that perhaps you cannot go, now is the time to sort of, what, exchange them? Um, mm-hmm. I, nev- I never have this problem about like, oh, I bought a Galley ticket. I guess I don't want to go anymore because it never happens. <laughs> Um, Chris, yeah, it's it's this. it's like it works? it's it's more or less like it's always been where you know if you have a ticket you can't go find somebody who wants to buy it you fill out a form you transfer the transfer the ticket it's also there for people who um, like if you maybe don't know who you're going with yes right, uh, and you just buy like four tickets all in your name and you want to actually assign somebody's actual proper name to one of the tickets uh-huh. and you can use it for that as well ah uh, I see okay. Well, good. Yeah, Cali in two months' time. Heavens me. Um, yeah, it's We'll be up. there, of course, as you know. We will be there, uh, if, if you didn't know already, but uh, that'll happen. So uh, that's happening. Um, what else we got here? Oh, yeah, uh, the, uh, Graham Harper. So the Who 77 uh, Promotions team has put together a, an event at uh, Hedra House in Leeds, so you got to be in Leeds. That's the only catch to this. Um, <laughs> of of an afternoon with Graham Harper. That is so cool. On Sunday, April nineteenth of uh, of twenty twenty, it's a it's a big old event too, like a full on proper uh, like two hour interview with uh, with Graham Harper. Uh, tickets are on sale. They are they are but what ten pounds? Is that what they 12. are right now? Twelve pounds. Yeah, it's a pretty good deal. Graham Harper. I had the honor. Oh yeah, I had I had the honor of uh, interviewing Graham Harper last year at Chicago Tartar Show, but an hour on stage, and I could have gone on for two more hours. It, there's just that much to talk about with the man, and he's such an ebullient fellow too. He yeah. really is, and he knows, and he just remembers everything. Like I, I remember, I asked him like, remember this one camera shot where the camera's pans around and stuff like a little crazy. I didn't think he'd remember it. He knew exactly what I was talking about. It's like you know, thirty five years later, and he's still on top. So. Uh, Graham Harper, afternoon with Graham Harper, directing the doctor's links in the show notes, uh, 52 tickets left in stock, uh, for that. Take a trip up to Leeds, or if you're from Leeds, stay there and watch Graham Harper on April 19th. Um, it's keenly recommended by us here at Radio Free Scarlet. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, also, hey, this, this is, uh, so Johnny Morris, uh, who has written several things for Big Finish and as a, uh, a regular writer for Doctor Who magazine and is indeed... A Doctor Who nerd. Shocking. <laughs> I know. He's, uh, he, he's, he's kind of like as as nerd as it gets. He really is because he turns that, that nerdiness into research and he's compiled basically a list of all the scripts, original and rehearsal, like rehearsal and camera scripts that exist regarding Doctor Who. Um, a lot of them surprisingly do exist either in the BBC archives or in private collections. Um, but there is a there's a tantalizing section where stuff doesn't exist, uh, like the original version of John Lucarotti's The Massacre, for instance. Um, there's the uh, like the six part version of The Hand of Fear that Bob Baker and Dave Martin uh, wrote is no longer like some of the stuff that doesn't exist, like Terrence Dix's original versions of State of Decay and the Five Doctors, the latter of which the Fourth Doctor had a major role in. Uh, that sadly is uh, is not around. I'm really surprised that Eric Sayward's original version of Resurrection of the Daleks doesn't exist because that was going to be the last story of season twenty. Is going to be called the Return. Uh, and they just sort of held it back because of strikes and, and made it in, in season 21. I'm mildly surprised that that doesn't exist anymore. But uh, but uh, have a look at his blog post, though. He's compiled a lot of stuff that um, that does exist. And you can read and indeed read about on Doctor Who production notes on DVDs because they often refer to the original scripts. So uh, what's next here? Oh, this, this was a funny thing. Uh, so... <laughs> Gareth David Lloyd, of course, played Deanto Jones on Torchwood, the Doctor Who spinoff Torchwood several years ago, uh, was uh, posted on Twitter about how he was uh, at, at Yanto's Shrine, which, God, I love that thing that it still exists. It's just amazing. And it's amazing it's still there. 
Yeah, it's, like yeah. it's all pieces of paper that should have faded long ago. Right? Uh, it's amazing. Anyway, he filmed a video uh, <laughs> of like some, oh, I'm here at the Angel Shrine. I think, oh, what's this? Someone's defacing it. And uh, the camera pans around. And it's Naoko Mori who is trying to put up all of these these uh, uh, tosh related, uh, tosh, tosh related memorial things. Photos. By the uh, way, if you guys would like to see a uh, another defacing of the Anto Shrine, I have mm-hmm. myself giving using my digit and my posterior to give my yeah. feelings about the shrine. If you I just know. type in probably Freiburg and Yanto Shrine and uh, disrespect or something in YouTube, it, but, <laughs> it was disrespectful. It was disrespectful. Yep, but, it was. Yeah. But this Highlight of my trip to Britain and Wales, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> anyway, funny video, funny video. Watch it. Links in the show notes. Um, RadioFreeScarrow dot com. Uh, a a couple um, of notable passings is how we end every episode of Radio Free Scarrow. It seems. Um, uh, the the first of which I'll, I'll mention because I, I'm more familiar with this person than I am with the, the second, even though Chris has listened to them in reverse order here. Richard Easton sadly passed away this past week. Yeah. Uh, Rich, Richard Easton was a Canadian actor. I never um, knew he was Canadian. He was Canadian. Uh, he was born in Montreal, died uh, at age of 86. Uh, he, I don't know the circumstances of his death. It's just that he was on Wikipedia. It mentioned that he died on December 2nd. But... Richard Easton, of course, is famous for us anyway, playing Captain Stapley in Time Flight. The the best re- the reason why Time Flight is still watchable, despite everything um, that's going that's, on around that's it. That's quite an assertion. But, it is, right. but Captain Stapley is such an amazing character and such a great yes, performance from argue with that. from Richard Easton. So it, it was uh, it was very sad that um, that he that he has passed away. I, I actually didn't know that he had died died like he suffered a heart attack on stage in 2006 <laughs> um, uh, at, with uh, in a play co-starring Ethan Hawke. And he actually like basically <laughs> died a little bit there before he was uh, revived oh. and, and uh, lived on for another almost 14 years. So, um, but, uh, but sadly passed away at the age of 86. Captain Stapley, one of the greats in Doctor Who history. Uh, and the second um, is uh, a, a Star Trek notable death. Uh, I, I saw, um, a, a, I can't remember who it was, someone in the Doctor Who world sort of tweeted out, uh, Star Trek has lost their Terrence Dicks, and in a way they have. Oh, DC, totally, yeah. DC Fontana died at the age of 80. I am not the the Star Trek uh, historian or, or, or giant fan as much, so I, I do not um, appreciate I mean, I the, the notability of, of her. Please do. If you read Please the do. fifty year if the fifty year mission, the first one, she and she had to say DC because at the time, you know, it was a sexist world of idiocy and she had to fake her name basically, just like James Tip Tiptree did, so people didn't know it was a female. But she pulled their butts out of the fire many a time in the original series and was yeah. one of the best writers. So she was so, she was responsible yeah. for um like all the Spock stuff. A lot a lot of mm-hmm. Spock's related stuff as well. And that was like, not an easy uh, room to be a woman in. <laughs> like, even though Gene Roddenberry was pretty progressive for the time, he was still a man of his time. And yeah, there was, yeah. and not just him. It's, you know, it's, it was the 1960s. She dealt with a lot more than she needed to, and she still was a vital part of that show. And mm-hmm. it wouldn't be around probably if not for her and the other people, but her as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, apparently she did 11, uh, writing credits on 11 episodes of Star Trek. So yeah, that's, that's like that's impressive. like a that's like a seventh of the series. And she did a bunch of novelizations too, I think, because I remember oh, yeah. being oh, familiar yeah. with the name from that. Yeah, that too. She also, you know, I mean, she worked on writing stuff for like all the way up until uh, like DS Nine and uh, and everything mm-hmm. else, and uh, like you know, yeah, she was all over. Um, and she was, she died at eighty, so she must have been really young when she started into Star Trek. So there's that mm-hmm. too. That too. Sub yeah, thirty, yeah. Um, she did uh, Star Trek animated series and. Um, she did, an yeah, underrated encounter, series, encounter I say. Farpoint. The, the animated series, really? <laughs> the animated series is actually, if you actually watch it, it is the fourth and fifth years of the show. It's oh. it's actually the stories. Yeah, it's cheese ball animation, and it's I actually love the jazzy soundtrack. But 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 it actually those are actually legit Star Trek stories. It's not kid stuff nonsense. Gilligan falling on his head or something. It's 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 actual Star Trek stories. Mm-hmm. Definitely from their time, but Star Trek stories. All right. Well, it's uh, it, it's it's sad, but it's also great to just have her legacy put into focus, I suppose. By uh, by uh, it was David Gerald actually broke the news on on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah they were really close friends, apparently. Lifelong friend, yeah. So former writer of Star Trek himself. So 
Uh, our condolences to all the uh, the Star Trek fans and family out there who uh, who enjoyed the work of DC Fontana. So uh, that's it for the for the news. Uh, after the break, an interview recorded at Chicago TARDIS a couple weekends ago with uh, former Doctor Who brand manager Edward Russell. So I'm joined by former Doctor Who brand manager uh, Edward Russell. First, hello, Edward. Hello, Stephen. You took the, you created the job of brand manager, or at least it became Ooh. your job, and then it left with you. Like you are the only historic. I don't. I don't. Well, the thing is, I can't take all the credit. I do take all the credit, but <laughs> right. there was a team of us. Uh, you know, I had a boss uh, uh, who was there, and then left, and then came back, and I had assistants, and I had people on the same level as me, but none of them are interested in any of this, and so I'm right. the one that's still around. Um, you know, I think a lot of the things we did came came from my brain. Um, and yeah, since I left, I mean, the way that the BBC works now and is structured is different, and that's why my job went. Um, and and so it's not fair to say that my job isn't happening. It's being done by other people mm-hmm. and, and lots of different people. Is this sort of done like internally? Like I don't know what the structure of things are now with BBC Studios sort BBC of like Studio. being the producer. It's, it's confusing. So you used to have BBC Worldwide, which was the commercial arm, because the way the BBC operates, the BBC couldn't do anything commercial. So you had the BBC and then you had BBC Worldwide. And now they found a way that they can co- coexist. Um, so uh, there are people looking after the brand uh, of Doctor Who in a different way than me. Um, but I don't know that much. I've not been back in two years, so right. <laughs> I have popped by and said hi to people. But but yeah, so I don't know. How, don't ask me how it's run now. No, no, I wouldn't <laughs> now. No, I, I'm just, you know, because we are, you know, it's funny thinking back to 2009, which was the first gap year, so to speak. Yeah. Like it was the first year, apart from the odd special here there, like we had to like, oh no, we have no Doctor Who really. Yeah. Uh, and now this year, 2019, has sort of been the third, because we had no Doctor Who in 2014? 20, 16, 16. 16 it was. Yes, it was 16. Uh, it took the year of hell off, uh, uh, thankfully, when we were losing all the celebrities and, it was, <laughs> and everything it? else. Was, it's a God, disastrous a year. year. I was kind of happy that we didn't have to sort of have Doctor Who saved yeah. at all. But my, my mate, you know, so... You know, it's a difficult thing, I suppose, to keep Doctor Who in the public eye for a year when it's not actually on air. Yeah. So you went through two of those. Like, what uh, what was it like sort of in 2009, sort of keeping it fresh, especially since you're doing, like, the yeah. transition. You're, like, excited for a new era and a new Doctor, but you're still, like, doing a swan song well, for David Tennant. For us, it never went off the air because I think uh, we filmed um, David's last stuff in... Maybe the art, March, April of 2009. I'm sure somebody's got a, a complete guide at home and they go, no, it was actually yeah. the May or something like that. But then we started with Matt stuff, uh, I think it was July or June even. So mm-hmm. for us, it was just nonstop. And don't forget Sarah Jane Adventures and Torture were still going. Yeah. But yeah, from the from the public's point of view, there was no Doctor Who on air in, t- in 2009 apart from that Easter special, the uh, the November special, and, yeah. and then uh, around Christmas. So. Yeah, it must have seemed a bit weird. You know, back then, it was a good thing. It was a good thing to have no Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Um, Doctor Who had been massive for a couple of years, in the UK at least. I can't really talk about what it was like in the States and Canada then because it was because I wasn't really across it and what right. was happening. But we, we'd always fought when we were off air to keep it quiet. Um, and so we would try and keep publicity low because that way, when it came back, we could make a bit of a noise. Mm-hmm. And so for us, keeping it off there was was good thing. And it's you know, Doctor Who is different now, and the way TV works is different now. You need to keep noise all the time. A lot of it's social media. You need to keep feeding the beast, as it were. Mm-hmm. So I think the the guys uh, certainly for our period in 2016, we we had to find ways to keep it alive. Um, and for 2019, I imagine it's been similar for the guys working on it now. But it's not just keeping it live. Uh, you've also got to keep people employed. Yes. So if it's not on air, right? They're, they're, there are people not being employed. And and the, the problem then is when you then want to employ them, they've all gone off and done other jobs and you can't get stuff. So that's why class was devised. Right. So Stephen Moffat could not do a series of Doctor Who because he was making a series of Sherlock. Uh-huh. Uh, and so the way around it was uh, to, to create class, uh, which, which Stephen was across, um, but it had its own, show, its own showrunner. Uh, and I think that first series of class is great. It's not brilliant, but there's some real potential in it. I think some of the actors, well, all the actors are great. I think Sophie in particular is fantastic. I would have loved to see where that would have gone if we gone another, got another series. It would have been 
um, it had the potential to be really, really great. It never happened, but there mm-hmm. we go. So that was a weird one because you know uh, I think what in the UK it obviously went out like on BBC Three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Canada, my home country, it yeah. aired I think like in October as well. BBC yeah. America chose to hold it back. They to held air it back the next series of Doctor Who. They did. They they made a decision to do that, and I think it's partly because they had their own series coming out um, around the time when it would have broadcast in the UK. Um, and they wanted to put the priority there, and they just felt that class on its own w- may, may not succeed. Whereas if they put it against Doctor Who, it would have done. And that just meant that the noise in the world was a little bit quieter. Mm-hmm. And the way it was released in the UK when it was on um, iPlayer, BBC Three, so it's it's kind of uh, it, it just ha- it dropped online, and then it would be shown on BBC One at a late time. It just it just all was not very um, what's the word? It felt it lacked direction and. Um, and well, if fans felt that it's true, it did, yeah. and it and that wasn't because you know, people didn't care about it. It's just we had a lot of people, other other partners involved, like America, BBC mm-hmm. Three, etc. And I think that's part of the reason why I don't want to say it failed, but it, it's part of the reason why it wasn't the huge success it could have been. Right? Does BBC America carry a lot of clout when it comes to um, Doctor Who in general? The, the decisions, the production, the uh, promotion at all? Or I, I guess they do in some respects. I mean, I. Uh, I'll caveat by this by saying I don't know how it works now, yeah. and, I, and I don't want to tread on anyone's toes. But at various points when I was involved in the series, yes, it did um, uh, a lot because they're an investor, um, and uh, they want, and, and also we want it to be a success in America. If the su- series is a success in America, it opens so many other opportunities. And tiny things like with merchandising. For years, we've been trying to do Doctor Who Lego, and they didn't want to do it because Doctor Who wasn't a big brand around the world. Yeah. As soon as we really cracked America, then they did Doctor Who Lego and stuff. So there were lots of reasons to keep uh, America happy. But it's like any contributor, partner, or anything like that. Yeah, they did carry clout, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned 2009 about what this show was like here. BBC America didn't pick it up. No. Until Planet of the Dead. Yeah. Uh, in June. Yeah. Three months after it aired in the UK. So yeah. that, that was their first like Comic-Con appearance. So like it's weird to think back of that first gap year being yeah. honestly just the burgeoning of its international. Yeah, it was. You know? It really was. Because I think you had it on Sci-Fi Channel out here, didn't you? I think um, it was, yeah. So so it was available, but mm-hmm. it, it, it wasn't huge. Um and and it felt and it's you know a number of coincidences that it's the first Matt Smith and first Stephen Moffat era, mm. but it felt that felt that that was when it became an international show and a big American show, and I think the thing to bear in mind is, you know, ratings wise, um, we see the ratings that that it has on BBC America, which are okay, they're not huge. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were always aware that there were people watching it in other ways whether they were legal or all through things like Netflix, Amazon, whoever's carrying yeah. it in the States and iTunes and stuff like that. If you look at the amount of merchandise that's sold in the US, it's not on a par with a show that's only getting two, three million viewers. So I think um, we don't know how many people watch on Netflix or iTunes. Yeah. Uh, uh, those companies do not release it. But Doctor Who is a much bigger show than those figures in BBC America suggest. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean... Credit BBC America. They have thrown a lot of enthusiasm and promotion and money behind it all. But it is, it all, it does seem blasphemous for me to watch <laughs> it with commercial breaks. Oh, you yeah. know, because it's not made for commercial breaks. It's, you no. know, it's not scripted. It's not shot. It's not building up to a natural cliffhanger before yeah. commercial break. So I think that's perhaps why a lot of people, you know, might find see, other ways to watch find it. other ways to watch it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember. The, I can't remember which is the first one I saw, but when I came over here and saw it that way, it was like it was really weird, yeah. uh, and it, it doesn't work because it's not made to be absorbed in that way. I think with Torchwood, I think they deliberately made it the duration work for the states. So I think it's fifty minutes, yeah, so. which is an Amer- American hour. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was at least there was some attempt to make it fit a bit better. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's funny actually looking back. You're talking about like keeping people employed. I mean, I think Russell T Davies specifically created Torchwood and Sarah Jane for that Adventures very reason. Yeah. To keep people employed year round. Yeah, I mean that's his official reason, and, and that's a big reason. But I think it was just the fact that we could, mm-hmm. and you know, it nearly killed Russell doing that. He was doing all three series, and he was across everything. I mean, Russell's a genius anyway, but he he was across all the stuff that I did and all the merchandise and, and everything, and he had a say in it. Um, and you know, people say, "Oh, so Stephen wasn't so involved in that," and he wasn't. But also, the show was much bigger under Stephen. You know, it was quite small relatively speaking when Russell was across it so he was able to do everything right. um, but yeah so I had a question earlier when I was doing a panel here at, at Chicago when people said what was your favourite era and I think possibly that series 3, 4 of 
Russell, David Tennant's time because it was just huge but contained. It was like a mm-hmm. contained explosion. Whereas later on, it was harder. Yeah, that was like pre-Twitter when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, it was, and that made a big difference as yeah. well. Yeah, they didn't have you didn't have to worry about the social media aspect. Of you things. didn't, and I think you know, social media, Twitter, or whatever you want to say, has has seeped into our everything now, and everything is a reaction to that. And it's a, you know, it won't last forever, but it's a it's a horrible part of modern life, unfortunately. <laughs> and we we didn't have that, but we still had you know we were still aware of what the fans yeah. were saying. We would peep peep at you know Gallifrey Base or whatever, and 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 stuff I mean when I say we I would maybe one or two other words I'm sure Russell was aware of stuff but most people didn't care you think about most people making Doctor Who or in a muddy field at 3 o'clock in the morning in South Wales they didn't they wouldn't even know what Gallifrey Base was so uh, yeah they weren't worried Mm -hmm. (laughs) so launching a new series of Doctor Who is always a thing Mm -hmm. Uh, you launched quite a few over your time at Doctor Who so what challenges I suppose you have like you have to sort of like try and do it differently and yeah. but yet not like be against the spirit of the show I mean what, what explain your experiences of, of doing that well the, the thing that changed the most is when we first started promoting them um, uh, we were very much promoting to the the journalists to the listings magazines to the the, the media around uh, the audience not the audience themselves so we were making it a big thing for them so we would hold uh, screenings of the episodes uh, in advance so that the journalists could write about it um, by the by the time I left it became much more of a public thing we would do these massive screenings um, in the states and in the UK and you know around the world for yep. 2014 uh, and again again in 2015 um, where uh, sorry in 2017 yeah. um, where it became a big public thing and that you know that's that's the way that television has changed and the television market has changed so that's the biggest fundamental change between 2006 and 2017 mm-hmm. when I left um, but we were at a real advantage because every series there was something different so the first series I was involved with series 2 you had a new doctor so that was the promotion that was the hook the next series I was involved you had a new companion the first black female companion yeah. so that was a hook uh, next series you had Catherine Tate who was a big star in the UK and you know reasonably well known here as well that was the hook Matt Smith so then we get to series 6 and that was the first time there was nothing new so series 5 you've got Matt Smith and Karen Gillan and then obviously Arthur Delville as well and then series 6 it was the same thing again and that was when we got to the first like oh what are we what are we trying to say in, that's different about Doctor mm-hmm. Who because you know fans are going to watch every series anyway you're not trying to reach those fans you're trying to reach the general public or the people that don't watch Doctor Who have watched it in the past but don't watch it anymore or the people that have never seen it and you want to attract and so you need to have a hook um, and for 2000 for, sorry for series 6 we didn't have that hook so that was really tough. What we did have is we had those big lush episodes filmed in the States in Monument Valley yeah. and stuff like that. So we had some great imagery and and opportunities to say that there was, you know, this new new feel to Doctor Who. In the UK, that kind of went against us because some people would say that we love it because it's a really British show and now it's becoming really American. Uh-huh. Um, I can remember, for example, there's a line in, in The Impossible Astronaut at the opening where... Rory talks about getting gas. Right. I think, you know, the, is it they lighting a bonfire or something? I can't remember. Yeah, what yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. And there was a letter of complaint saying, it's petrol. In the UK, we do not, I do not like this Americanization <laughs> of it and stuff like that. And that really annoyed me because if I'm over here and I want to get petrol, I don't ask for petrol, no. I ask for gas. When you're over here, I walk on a sidewalk, you know, it's stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but that's, you yeah, know, the mad, the mad people out there. Um, <laughs> did, anyway. I mean, this might seem cynical. Did BBC America influence the decision to have those first two episodes set in the United States and thus film there? Um, no, I don't think they did. I think they weren't against it when that happened. I think a lot of these, a lot of overseas, overseas filming happens because there are tax breaks to do it. Mm. So it can actually work out cheaper to do stuff. So I know the new series has done a lot in South Africa. Yeah. We did a lot in um, Spain and Lanzarote in the late, later years that I was doing there. And I think they were just able to cost it up and make it work so that they could come to the States. And there is an added vo- uh, you know, advantage of it. It it does make your episode look great. It is a bit weird how all these alien adventures happen in southeast uh, England during the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yeah. So to be able to take it and make it really global is, is fantastic. Um, I don't remember BBC America making it happen. They may have had influence when we did stuff in New York for the Angels Take Manhattan and stuff like that. They they would certainly have made it easier for us mm-hmm. because it's not easy to go and film in New York. Uh, no. And if you've got somebody on the ground that can help you, then that would help. But I don't remember them sort of saying, you know, we'll give you extra money if you can do that. I think they jumped on it when they knew we were in the States and said, look, can you do a bit of extra photography? Can they do chat shows and stuff like that? Right. But they were in, they, they, their sway in that way was more with Comic-Con. So they would 
they would yes. pay uh-huh. their budget would help bring Matt, Peter, whoever out to do Comic Con. I was going to ask about that actually very next. Like, how was did that change? I suppose your scope and how to present the show. Like having a big sort of like movie style trailer. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely, year. definitely had an effect. And it, what it mainly did is it meant we messaged a bit earlier. So obviously, Doctor Who started at different points in the year, but generally um, around that period, it was coming around back around September time. Yeah. Um, and Comic-Con is, you know, third week of July. San Diego Comic-Con, I should point out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we would have to be putting a pretty big message out that early, which in terms of marketing, you don't normally want to do. And it's not just TV, it's anything. You don't want to put a big message out three more months before people can uh, access it. Right. Uh, so we, we would have wanted to do a little teaser, but then Comic-Con would be like, okay, can we have something a bit bigger? And BBC America would want something a bit bigger. So, yeah. And obviously, the the series isn't ready at this point. It's mm. it's you know not all of it's been filmed, and the post production hasn't been done. So it was a, always a constant battle to try and get the best stuff on screen. Um, so it did change stuff. BBC, sorry, America um, promotes their shows a lot sooner than the UK does as well. Yep. So in the UK, they don't generally promote stuff until two three weeks out, whereas in the US, it's it's five six weeks out and so that caused some conflict but if not longer i mean uh, yeah. the new picard show star trek picard yeah weeks if not months ago they announced coming january 23rd like there's your drop dead yeah broadcast date and that's never been the case yeah for doctor who so no. was that was that always a sort of a tug of war was, like yeah it was they want you know i want to say they i mean i guess i mean bbc america yeah. they wanted it announced sooner or, or promoted sooner we wanted to hold back uh, later but you know what whenever there's conflict um you get creativity so we would come up with really clever things to do and and it worked it worked in the end mm. and everybody was happy i yeah. think um i now speaking of canada yeah as i am canadian yeah. i have to include some canadian content in this i always <laughs> i always felt you contractually obliged a little that. bit actually <laughs> I, I always felt like canada was sort of second class in a way and they would get whatever bbc america got but yeah. they were never told first i don't know what was your experience with that um i yeah, I mean, because Canada were contributing to the show from the beginning of it coming back. The you know, CBC we in the all first know couple of years, that. yeah. Um, and I think it's, uh, we would have liked to get the cast to go out there, but it's such a long way to travel. And, you know, okay, they went to Australia. But uh, <laughs> I, now, I can't remember his name, but I remember that we did have a Canadian host come out and interviewing the guys. Um, Teddy, something I remember he was called Teddy. Yeah, Teddy Wilson from Teddy uh, Wilson. They had yeah. a little uh, inner space as a daily yeah. uh, program. So he have. came over, and I remember looking after him for the day, and he was a really lovely guy, really nice. And yeah, he got to meet the cast. So we did do stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I'm sorry if the Canadians felt like they were the the poor relations in this. Uh, um, if they <laughs> if they were, it was not because people didn't care about Canada right. at all. But. But yeah, there were occasional forays. I think whenever they went to New York, that might have been a day trip. I think yeah. Peter Capaldi made his way up to he Toronto did. once, he for did. instance. It's he a short hop, so indeed, yeah. I mean, when the guys came over, they weren't on holiday at all. They, it wasn't a vacation for them. They were worked from eight, you know seven in the morning till nine at night. So yeah. uh, uh, although they did, when we did the world tour, um, mm-hmm. the first one in 2014, so they got to go literally around the world. I think they went to Seoul, then to Australia, then over to New York, and Mexico, all the way down to Mexico I and Brazil, all that kind of, I think Brazil, Brazil, yeah. yeah. Um, and I didn't get to go, and I was a bit. <laughs> but there had to be somebody doing the approval. So they were doing right. photos, um, they were doing interviews and stuff, and somebody at the BBC had to see this stuff to approve it. So I did it. So I would be up at night as they were traveling around the world. I would be up and doing the approvals. Mm-hmm. So they were gone for like two weeks. And I stayed in Cardiff and did all the approvals. I ended up getting jet lag because my body clock was at the same as theirs. Right. But I never left. I never left Cardiff. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, the Didn't, perils. Yeah. yeah, there are worse things to happen in life. Uh-huh. So back to 2016 because uh, you know we're, that was the last big gap year, I suppose, yeah. with No Do Doctor Who. What? Did you do to sort of try to keep it in the public eye? Now, now that Twitter was a thing, and yeah, everything Twitter else. was really helpful. Yeah. And, I, and I think you know you try different things, and um, I'm not sure how much it worked. But a lot of the things was doing was doing constant tweets about you know it's uh, Michelle Gomez's birthday, blah blah blah, and do a little missy kind of stuff. Right. There was a hook; you could do something every day. We would have weekly meetings with the social team, with the marketing team, and sort of say, "What can we do to to get stuff out there?" You don't want to put too much out there, but you want it to to remain in in the public's consciousness. Mm-hmm. So I think social was a big thing that we did. Um, there were behind the start scenes stuff that hadn't gone out that we could slowly leak uh, and yeah. stuff. Um, and we wanted to 
we were still filming it you know obviously it wasn't on air until 2017 but there was things being filmed and we had a new companion so we could we could put out press releases the um the new team and i don't really want to talk about the new team because it's somebody else's job now it's yeah, not yeah. my but they they've they've very much um kept stuff in yeah. uh, and I, I admire that i think it's incredible how they've managed to do it um but that's completely against what we were doing we we felt it was important to keep it uh in, in the public's perception at least vaguely anyway uh, and yeah through social media was the main way we did it mm. but you still need you can't be non-stop because then how do you change the message when a, a series is coming up right if, if people are constantly getting Doctor Who it's wallpaper mm-hmm. so when there's actually a new series that people will be like well I didn't even know it was off air so yeah. so you have to be clever about it not to throw current teams under the bus either or anything like that, but how much is, like, I sense that the current regime is a little yeah. more secretive. Is that, like, a lot of what you do, is that driven perhaps also by the production office as well? Like, we should maybe we should scale back and not talk as much about that? Yeah. Or? No, a lot of it was, was just to own own the, the situation, the story. So a lot of the time, if we put out a picture of, I don't know, the, the Mondasian Cybermen, right. it was because they were going to be on the streets. Yeah. And if we did it and we had a really cool picture um, of them looking incredible, that's better than a blurred picture uh, taken on somebody's iPhone that makes it into the, the national press and stuff yeah. like that. So we felt that we w- so a lot of the time we announced stuff to prevent it from leaking um, and to control that moment. Uh, so that's why we did a lot of it. Um, and you know sometimes we could keep it secret we couldn't believe it when we kept John Sim secret as long as we did for you know uh, well they did put him in the, the trailer the next time trailer yeah, in they, episode one and I yeah. think a few people were like oh, well we would I don't know if we would have noticed or was was there a fear perhaps that you that it would leak that his well I think yeah I'm trying to remember the, the, what happened in that situation because I don't think everything that happened was very clear because because it was put in the trailer that was shown to press, yeah. and then the press announced it, yeah. and uh, and on one hand people were like, "Oh my god, that's awful of the press," and then on the other hand it's like, "Well, how stupid of the Doctor Who team to think that they could not it wouldn't leak," and I think we did. I think we deliberately did do it uh, so that it would leak, and that might be contradicting something that's been said in the past, right. but we kind of knew it. You don't cast an actor like John Sim. Um, and not try and get publicity for it, mm-hmm. uh, and and yeah, people go well that spoils the surprise, but it doesn't really. I mean, the the fact that John Sim is in the episode and is a surprise probably interests the ten percent of people watching who are hardcore film fans. Right, but you know. We're not making the show just for them. We were making the show for the ninety other percent of other people that mm-hmm. were just like, "Oh my god, I'm going to watch it because John Sim is in it." That kind of stuff. Right. So it's it's a compromise, and uh, you can never keep everybody happy. But in the end, that series was really popular. Those two episodes, I think, are some of the finest that uh, Stephen is responsible for. So it all worked out in the end. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> I think it did. Um, the fiftieth anniversary. Um, the, the perfect year of Doctor Who, <laughs> let's face it, there was all sorts of things going on. I've talked to you about this to you on a panel before, but not on a recorded mic, so therefore it's all new to me once again. Uh, where do you start with that year? How, how, how long in advance were you planning for it, I suppose, knowing that it was going to be such a massive year for Doctor well, Who? Well, there, there, there was several threads that were being planned. So obviously, from Stephen's point of view and the, 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 the TV show, he was very aware that he would have to do something special. And the production was very aware that they would have to do something special. BBC Worldwide saw it as an opportunity to... Uh, this makes it sound really cynical, but this is how the, the business operates, to sell more merchandise. Mm. Um, and then from the brand point of view, we saw it as an opportunity to celebrate Doctor Who and make it feel part of uh, the British heritage and make the public feel that they owned it. Um, and and so there were plans, there was there were like Cobra-like meetings happening um, at, from the end of 2012 when we would get people together and try and work out uh, situations and, and how it would work. But it wasn't, you know, it didn't go back to 2009 or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So you had these three separate people all trying to find ways to celebrate it. And I guess I got to be across all of that and, and speak to them all. It was a really tough year. I, I, I feel what we accomplished was brilliant. When I look back at 2013, mm-hmm. um, I will write it down one of these days. But, you know, there was more hours of Doctor Who on TV than there have been in any previous year this series I saw someone on Twitter saying that that was a lie but it wasn't if you count it up if you count up series 7B all those minutes if you count up the anniversary special the adventure in space and time the um, the Peter Capaldi announcement the the 
D- Doctor Who after party, the Blue Peter specials, and all the kind of stuff that mm-hmm. you did the, the, the night of the Doctor. There are more minutes that year than we did. We did stamps. We did the big convention. We did the simulcast in ninety six countries. We did the cinema screenings. It, yeah. was, it was huge. It was absolutely huge. It was also a horrible time because that oh, we had the missing episodes we covered that as well. That too, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, it was a really horrible time because we're talking about Twitter again. I just remember the fans being really horrible. I remember Stephen leaving Twitter either at the end of 12 or beginning of 2013 because fans were just horrible to him mm-hmm. and he just thought, kind of thought why do I need this um, I remember I remember I got some stick uh, when when the missing episodes went out and I I reviewed I watched an, uh, Web of Fear and I said something like uh, I can't remember my exact phrase but I said uh, just watched it it's, it's really good but not amazing and I got backlash for, <laughs> for saying it wasn't amazing right uh, and I look back at that and I laugh at it and I said I said it was good <laughs> but that's not good enough I remember seeing tweets asking that I should be sacked and stuff like that mm-hmm. and it's, uh, it's just how mad people were but Stephen had made a, def- a, a definite decision at the beginning of the year to uh, not say what we were doing because he said if we said what we were doing in advance people would only be disappointed mm-hmm. because that's how people work yep. so it's much easier to leak, leak it out not leak it out seep it out throughout the year and stuff which is what we did in the end and I think that probably was the right decision but it did mean there was a period where I felt the fans were really against us and they felt they were going to be let down mm-hmm. but I think when you get to November the 24th thing everybody felt really satisfied with how it went yeah. you know there are some people that, that it's never enough but I think generally people were happy and the quality was good as well, as well it wasn't just quantity it, what we did Night of the Doctor was great. Day of the Doctor is a fantastic episode that stands up today. Yeah, uh, uh, and so yeah, I'm I'm really satisfied with it. But it was hard work. I, I remember just like at the end coming home from the cinema and just like I couldn't I couldn't do it anymore. I was just yeah. exhausted, emotionally yeah. exhausted. You know, being a fan for as long as I have yeah. been. And then you have to ramp up because in a month you're saying goodbye to one of your most yeah. popular doctors. So how do you do? How do you was, sort of switch gears like that? It was, it was, it was. Oh god, it was crazy. And I think by that time, have we started filming with Peter? No, I don't think we started filming with Peter, Peter until the January. So we were, yeah. You have to remember that we were always in our heads ahead of everything else. Yeah. So you'd be having a series going out, but we were already filming the next series and stuff like that. So at the point when. The, the anniversary was going on we were prepping the next series uh, so for us it was seamless it just a, a loop that c- that continues mm-hmm. but that is the beauty of Doctor as, as one door closes another door opens and that you know you really see that on the anniversary year yeah. and I'm sure I, I don't know I've never discussed with Matt when he planned to leave mm-hmm. but I think he was aware that his tenure would take in the 50th and I knew that he wasn't going to leave before the 50th he wanted to be the doctor at the 50th mm-hmm. um, and it kind of works that he leaves not long after um, yeah yeah I, I, comp- I mean I wasn't uh, sort of aware of Doctor Who in the UK in 83 for the 20th anniversary but I I compare the 20th and the 50th a little bit just because there's a big sort of like BBC push for the yeah. 20th and then after that their interest really wanes off not not as you know dram- more dramatically than yeah. it did now I, I, I feel think like there was a lack of not a lack of enthusiasm but a comparative lack of enthusiasm I from think, upstairs uh, I think you have to remember that that is how broadcasters operate. They have a big thing every year. So in 2012, the, the big thing was the Olympics in the UK. Yeah. Uh, and then 2013, it was us. Uh, you know, 2015, I think it was EastEnders' 30th anniversary. That's where all the attention went. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's not necessarily one big show that gets the attention, but it's, it's a stream where it's drama or sport or something like that. And yeah, we had it in 2013. They put a lot of money behind us because mm-hmm. it was a big thing uh, for the BBC. And not just money, they put a lot of attention and care and people uh, behind us and then that went um, and so but I think it's inevitable I'd, you know viewing figures do not tell the story of success of Doctor Who because mm-hmm. the most successful in the in the UK most successful series of the 21st century are Christopher Eccleston's series and um, uh, Jodie Whittaker's I think the most popular with the public are probably series 4 3 and 4 yeah. David Tennant and probably around the, the 50th anniversary that's the bit that the public will remember Doctor Who for mm-hmm. um, so I think it was inevitable that after the 50th that there would be a decline yeah we may be saved a bit of it by having Peter Capaldi um, and yeah they've saved it a bit by having Jodie Whittaker and the whole change to the show which has been phenomenal mm-hmm. and has been successful um, has saved it but most TV series most drama series in the UK and the US do not last beyond 8 or 9 series Mad Men Breaking Bad didn't make it that far you know they do yeah. about 8 series and then that's it mm-hmm. so for Doctor Who to be on series 12 and still be success is pretty good 
but it's basically relaunching a new show in a way every yeah. two or three years. Yeah. That's kind of the 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 bane, and I suppose the the yeah. joy of Doctor Who is that you're basically relaunching a new show. Yeah, and I think you have to accept with the, it's not just the new Doctor. Quite often that coincides with a change in showrunner and a change change in direction. Mm-hmm. And I think you have to accept that you are going to lose people along the way because they're quite drastic changes. There's a big change between series four and series five. Yeah. They look different. You know, they're, you know, they're in HD or not, but uh, but they look and feel different. Um, you know, there's a massive change between series uh, 10 and, and, and 11 mm-hmm. uh, you are going to lose people but you're going to gain new people as well that's the nature of the show that's mm-hmm. why it's run for 56 years more yeah. or less you're still in the industry now but <laughs> uh, but do you do you miss the brand managing days of Doctor Who? <laughs> yes and no I mean I'll be honest and say there's a part of me that does it it's a bit like I can't remember if I've said to you this I can't remember if I said this to you before, Stephen, but it's a bit like you've been with a partner for a very long time and you're happy to split. Mm -hmm. You've decided to go your own way. It's amicable and you want them to be happy. But you still get a bit jealous when you see them with their new partner and stuff like that. And that's how I feel about Doctor So when I see it go out and and I see fans going, yeah, it's so good. Part of me is like, yes, they're they're Uh doing it. And part of me is like, oh, it's kind of good when we did it as well. (laughs) Uh, So I do miss it to an extent. I miss being part of it. Um, uh, But at the same time, I don't want to be part of it anymore. It's part of my life that I've I've moved on from. Uh, you know, so maybe Doctor Who fans will find that strange to believe because I think some of the people we meet here at conventions would never leave if they had the opportunity. But you have to do new things in life. You have to mm-hmm. find new things and stuff like that. Um, so, so I don't miss it hugely. Uh, but there, there, there will always be love and affection for it there. Um, who knows, maybe one day they'll offer me a job that I, I'll not be able to say no to. <laughs> Maybe they won't. <laughs> in which case, I'll still be speaking to you, Stephen, in 10 years' time. <laughs> I look forward to it. Edward Russell, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edward. Goes to, goes to a lot of conventions now, does Edward Russell, to various... Yeah. I think he'll be at Gallifrey 1, but he was at last one, last two Gallifrey 1s, actually, and, uh, and uh, now the Chicago TARDIS. So interesting to hear just about how... Doctor Who was launched and how the the comment that I know you two haven't uh, heard the interview yet, but um, uh, he said, to, you know, during the gap year, like it was almost like they wanted to like keep Doctor Who off the public mind back in like 2008 or nine or something like that, just to sort of give it a bit of a rest. So just to get too overexposed. This is the days before Twitter, of course, you know, when, uh, when oh. <laughs> the wonder years, I believe they're called <laughs> those years. Oh, uh, and Kevin Arnold was all happy and stuff. Yeah. Um, so that was that was interesting. I've, I always like to hear about uh, behind the scenes stuff and how decisions are made and and you know forethought and everything else putting put into it. But um, so interesting stuff. Uh, also interesting. Next week will be an interview with Nick Briggs. Usually Nick Briggs and I sit down at Chicago Tardis at usually on a Sunday afternoon when the things about to wrap up and just sort of catch up and and just sort of you know. I, I often go in with that without a single thing planned to talk to him about. Just usually an interesting conversation springs up. And uh and Nick was was not there this year. It was actually kind of like I, I miss our chats. And so we recreated what we would have probably done at the end of the Chicago TARDIS and uh and spoke on Skype uh this past week. Uh, about whatever. Uh, once again, we didn't uh, we didn't have anything planned. We sort of got into a, a very interesting talk about about the process of writing, and uh, and and perhaps the privilege of position of having an outlet to write, and when you don't have an outlet to write, how difficult it can be sometimes. So, so it's an interesting chat, and that's uh, that will be on the next episode of Radio Free Scar, along with our Christmas gift guide. Uh, for all the merch stuff that we... Uh, <laughs> Which will probably be twice as big then next week. <laughs> it probably will be. So uh, expect uh, that next week. And of course, once again, please do tune in to the video versions of the RFS Fluid Winks. We're begging uh, you here. Come on. Uh, all, all, uh, all on YouTube. All on YouTube. And in the show notes. They get posted. They're on Twitter, everywhere. Do, yeah. do check them out. Uh, we enjoy making them. They're a lot of work, but we hope you enjoy them, making them. And of course, they're on the audio versions as well, so... All that stuff and more. Busy week. Uh, all the stuff in one calendar year happening in one single calendar week. And uh, we all have talked about it here on this episode of Ready Free Scarrow. So do join us next week. There's a good person. Um, until then, I am Stephen in Edmonton. Or in Vancouver. And Chris in Edmonton. So long for now. You've been listening to Radio Free Scarrow 
Find us online at RadioFreeScaro.com. Follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Radio Free Scaro. Subscribe to us on iTunes and donate to the show at Patreon.com forward slash Radio Free Scaro. Thank you. Thank you.